Good morning. I am Pastor Patty Axel, and today I bring you the good news of Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 14 to 29. Glory to you, O Lord. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason, these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah, and others said, it is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and his officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half of my kingdom. She went and said to her mother, What should I ask? And her mother said, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Lord, sometimes your word is hard to hear. We are often indicted by your message of justice and mercy. Open our ears to hear as you speak truth to our lives and open our hearts to receive the love you intend for all of our neighbors. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Wigiot, where is God in all of this? In seminary, our pastoral care professor, Tony Everett, would ask that question, challenging us to look for God in the world around us, for surely God was there, even if we couldn't see Today, I take that a step further and ask, after reading this passage in the sixth chapter of Mark, where in the world is the gospel in this? The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ, but where is the good news in the unjust killing of John the Baptist at the hands of Herod at the request of his 12-year-old daughter? It just doesn't make sense. We witness Mark again using the literary intercalation, which basically is sandwiching a story in the midst of another story to make a connection in the reader's mind. In this case, the story of John the Baptist's death lies in between Jesus commissioning the disciples and them returning. This reminds the reader that not all is good in the kingdom. If you speak the truth to power, you may get killed. Leaders with power often cave when the going gets rough. Even leaders who may have a certain fascination of the one they kill, but succumbs to the pressure put on by family members or friends. For example, Herod was threatened by John, but liked to listen to him. He was thrown into prison for challenging Herod and Herodias for marrying each other when Herodias had been the wife of Herod's brother Philip. Herodias hated John and wanted him dead. Herod could protect him somewhat in prison, but then made that foolhardy oath to his daughter when she danced for he and his guests. She asked for John's head on a silver platter, with her mother's suggestion, of course, and Herod would lose face if he didn't follow through on the oath to give her whatever she wanted. It's not only powerful leaders who use their power to destroy. 
It can also be some women behind those powerful leaders. John's death was gruesome and unjust at best. At the worst, it was a shameful account that he was condemned at the hands of a woman. Now, it's quite interesting that the woman in the last story, Sandwich, were not named. They were known only by their relationship, as in Jerry's daughter, or by their disease and the woman with the issue of blood. Today, the two women in the gospel are named, so we don't forget their evil deeds. Ultimately, though, Herod is to blame. He's the one who could have told his daughter no, but he didn't. The story that brackets this is Jesus sending of his disciples with just a cloak, sandals, and a staff. One coat, not two, and directions to brush, brush the dust off your feet and move on if they were not received well. This he may have said because the story that preceded this was Jesus' harsh rejection at the hands of his hometown neighbors. The connection between John's ministry and life and death at the hands of the powerful points directly at Jesus and what will ultimately happen to him. Since the beginning, John has had a clear understanding of what his role in life is, to point to Jesus. Jesus must increase as John decreases. That certainly appears to be happening. Jesus points to God the Father and hushes anyone who may be able to identify him as the Son of God. This is what we call the Messianic secret. The focus of Jesus' ministry in Mark is Jesus' passion and death and what that means for the Christian life. It is a life of suffering witness. The agents of God who challenge those in power usually suffer significant consequences. No de good deed goes unpunished may be the warning Jesus wants to give his disciples as they go out. It is okay to wipe your feet off and move on. Not everyone will accept you and what you have to say. What message do we receive from this difficult text? Where is the good news here? Persevere in the face of danger because the truth must be spoken. The people must be loved and God must be praised. But pastor, don't preach politics from the pulpit. It makes people angry, you know. Technically, that refers to partisan politics. No campaigning for your favorite candidate in the pulpit. I learned the hard way that sometimes reminding the people of God that they must love everyone and that everyone is included at the table is considered political. Speaking the truth instead of the status quo is dangerous and can get you killed. Loving extravagantly, unconditionally, and always is frowned upon if you don't also judge the wicked and evil and cast someone into hell. So, Jesus, what are we supposed to do? Look what Jesus did. And I'm not just saying this to sell WWJD bracelets. When Jesus said to his disciples, if someone doesn't accept you, wipe the dust from your feet and move on, he never did that himself. He responded with compassion to those who loved and depended on him, and he did it to those who spat at him and made fun of him. He never fought back, but looked for those in the crowd, at the margins, in the lost and desolate places, and reached out to them. Even in Nazareth, there were some who believed, and he was able to heal. So what does that tell us? Jesus' ministry effectively showed us that there was nowhere we could be that Jesus wasn't willing to accompany us. There is nowhere in the world where God isn't, and in the most desolate landscape with the loneliest people, you can find Jesus. Even as Jesus hung on the cross shortly before he breathed his last breath, he promised the criminal that he, be, he would be with him in paradise. The cross of Christ is the reminder that Jesus suffered for us and Jesus suffers with us. We are never left at the foot of the cross alone. Now, being a faithful believer in and a follower of Jesus means you realize that this work is hard and often impossible for us, but the Holy Spirit accompanies us on this journey of love and sacrifice and makes our feeble attempts succeed. I thought about the poem often attributed to Mother Teresa, but actually penned by Kent Keith in 1968. 
Mother Teresa never said she wrote the poem, only that it was discovered from a sign on the wall of Shishu Bhavan, the children's home in Calcutta. And what I'm going to read to you are the paradoxical commandments. People are illogical, unreasonable, and self-centered. Love them anyway. If you do good, people will accuse you of selfish ulterior motives. Do good anyway. If you are successful, you win false friends and true enemies. Succeed anyway. The good you do today will be forgotten tomorrow. Do good anyway. Honesty and frankness make you vulnerable. Be honest and frank anyway. The biggest men and women with the biggest ideas can be shot down by the smallest men and women with the smallest minds. Think big anyway. People favor underdogs but follow only top dogs. Fight for a few underdogs anyway. What you spend years building may be destroyed overnight. Build anyway. People really need help but may attack you if you do help them. Help people anyway. Give the world the best you have and you'll get kicked in the teeth. Give the world the best you have anyway. If we only did things that were easy and pleasant, we wouldn't fully understand the depth of love that God has for us. When we step into the footsteps Jesus leaves for us, we may sacrifice our comfort and happiness. We may even be persecuted and killed, but we will experience peace and deep joy. Jesus never gave us the idea that life was easy, only that it was worth living for and loving others. In those relationships, we find Jesus. Amen and amen.